Okay. Again, thank you all so much for joining. This is our Tuesday 1.30 p.m. session with the uh, Legal Council. Uh, Lisa, if you could introduce yourself and your topic for today, we would really appreciate that. Absolutely. Okay. I am Lisa Brown. I'm a staff attorney with Legal Council for the Elderly. Um, and I'm going to be presenting today on life planning documents, which include powers of attorney, last will and testaments, and transfer on death deeds. Um, so sorry about, about that hiccup before. I'm just going to go through this. As I mentioned before, as I'm going through the presentation, please feel free to interrupt and ask any questions that you might have. So somebody has their hand raised now. Um, Denise Jackson, did you have a, a comment or question? Um, um, Lisa, I think that was from before. I think if we could just go through some of the session, it's already, we're already halfway with the time. So um, sure. can you see if you, if you could put your comments in the chat, we'd really appreciate that. We got to go with some of the material. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. So um, the life planning documents, um, as I said, include wills, powers of attorney, and transfer on death deeds. Um, a financial power of attorney is one of the powers of attorney, um, and the purpose of it is to appoint an individual to handle finances, legal and financial matters for the person who is getting the power of attorney done. The term durable, which you'll see when you're describing durable uh, financial power of attorney means that even if after getting the document completed, it the person becomes incapacitated, the document is still in effect. That's, that's the durable part. It means it survives incapacity. Um, the reason people get financial powers of attorney are to avoid guardianship, um, to get the assistance that they need, um, and they're also able to make the power of attorney either general or limited, which means that it's general, the power of attorney will allow the agent to um, assist with almost any financial matter. Um, if it's limited, then it might be limited in terms of what types of things a person can help with, or it might be limited to a particular period in time. Um, Meaning that, you know, if somebody just wants something done, you know, over the next month, they can limit it that way. Um, a financial power of attorney can be effective immediately um, once a person signs the document or um, what we call springing, which means only if, um, only if the person becomes incapacitated or some triggering event, like only upon a certain period of time. Um, it's important to know that a financial power of attorney is void once a person dies, and also that um, it can be changed or revoked in writing at any time, as long as the individual has capacity. In D.C., the financial power of attorney must be in writing, um, and it must be signed in front of a notary, okay? Um, we, we recommend having witnesses, um, but in DC, it, it has to be in front of a notary. A healthcare power of attorney is a different document, um, but similarly, it allows you to have an individual appointed um, who can make medical decisions for you know, the individual. Um, the healthcare power of attorney is only effective if the individual can't make the decision themselves. So unlike the financial, which can be effective immediately, the healthcare power of attorney in DC will only be effective if the individual can't make their own medical decision. Okay. It is also void once a person dies and it can be changed or revoked as long as it's in writing. Um, it, it, the document itself must be in writing. And the healthcare power of attorney has to be signed in the presence of two witnesses. Okay, and we recommend a notary as well. Okay, one part of a medical power of attorney 
um, you know, this, this part can be incorporated within the medical power of attorney or can be a separate document. And that's called a living will or an advanced medical directive. This uh, portion of a medical power of attorney allows an individual to document and state what they want to happen in the event that they are in an end of life um, situation. Um, individual can say how much um, life sustaining treatment they want. Um, if they only want to be um, given pain medication and they don't want to, for instance, um, be on life support, um, they can state that and um, you know that their doctors and their loved ones know their wishes. This will come up if somebody, um, has an incurable illness, such as advanced cancer. Um, they have a progressive functional deterioration, such as advanced dementia. If they're in a coma um, or a persistent vegetative state, um, again, it allows someone to say the level of pain medication as well as the level of life-sustaining treatment. and also allows a person to state their wishes regarding organ donation. Okay, so those are the two powers of attorney, um, again, financial and medical powers of attorney. Um, um, we may have a, we have a question, uh, Lisa. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Again, uh, I'll be able to see if we have any raised hands. So uh, um, Denise, you had a question for Lisa about anything she's covered so far? Yeah. Um, hi, how are you? Hi. Yeah, well, I had my hand raised for because at the beginning I was trying to tell y'all, um, all you gotta do is take your fingers and open it up with your fingers. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to, you know, go through all y'all was going through. Cause that's what I've been doing. And every time it changes and get lower, just take your fingers and keep opening it up. Oh yeah, you're right. That's what I was trying to say. I put oh. it in the chat, but Alex, um, <laughs> something oh, y'all told you, you know. Oh, and I we see. learned that in class, so. Oh. Yeah, it, yes. when yeah. you can't it's see something or read it, take your fingers and open it up. Yeah. yeah, again, it's a different it's a different device. We're just trying to work with what we Yeah, uh, but I open it up just now with my fingers. That's what I'm doing. So I can read it. Yeah. Yes, you can do that on your iPad as well. You can zoom in and zoom out with your fingers. So it just, you know, it, it's going to be a little different for everyone. But again, Denise, you had a question for uh, Lisa about anything she's yeah, covered no, so that far. Was, that was it. That's what I was trying to just say. Okay, thank Denise, you. thank you so much for sharing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, um, if there's no questions about the powers of attorney, I'm going to talk about the last will and testament. Um, the last will and testament allows individuals to give personal and real property to family, friends, and organizations or whomever they choose. Um, when a person is making a uh, last will and testament, they should know who the natural object of their bounty is. So for instance, um, you should know who the heirs would be, who would inherit um, if there was no last will and testament, which doesn't mean that that's who uh, property needs to be left to, um, but you wanna know that um, um, the state would or DC would um, say my spouse um, is the one who would inherit or my children would inherit. Um, but the last will and testament allows you to leave um, property to whomever you choose. It also allows a person to appoint a personal representative. So much, much like the agent I was talking about with the powers of attorney, um, there's a personal representative in your last will and testament who's responsible for making sure that what's in the will is carried out. Um, and um, also to make sure that any debts are paid um, as well. But but mainly their issue, their, their um, responsibility is to make sure that what you put in the will is actually carried out. A will can be revoked um, at any time, um, as long as the person may to have, you know, has capacity. And it can you know, be revoked or changed anytime before death. Um, 
at this time, um, it, it can't be filed with the court prior to death. Um, so it's, once a person dies, that's when um, the last will and testament will be filed in court. So it's different in different states. Some states, um, such as Virginia, for instance, allows um, individuals to file their last will and testament with the court. And some states um, don't allow that. Um, a last will and testament must be in writing and it must be signed by two witnesses, okay? There's also some additional language that's required in the last will and testament as well. So, um, you know, so- uh, yeah, uh, We have two questions. Um, sure. First sure. up uh, from Don in the chat, it says, where we may get that form from what agency? So uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure this specific form, but are you talking about the last will and testament, Ms. Donna? Um, can, are you able to answer that, Ms. Lisa? Sure. So um, legal counsel for the elderly does help individuals with last will and testaments and the, um, and the powers of attorney. There are other organizations also um, that, that do so. Um, we provide, um, you know, that as a service, um, generally free of charge as long as the individual qualifies for the service. So uh, basically call are... the call the uh, hotline number, is that right? Lisa? That's right, that's right. Yes, because every, every, you know, even if it's the same thing, everyone's going to be a little bit different, right, in uh, regards to their circumstances. So uh, definitely give them a call. I just re-put their number in the chat as well. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, Anne, uh, you had a question about uh, anything we've covered so far? Um, yeah, I wanted to ask you, Lisa, um, if, you, uh, if the person who is your power of attorney uh, becomes incapacitated or dies, should you uh, immediately change that person? Yes, you should. But um, it usually people will pick more than one person um, mm -hmm. as their agents or as their personal representatives. So, what the way we normally do it is you will choose you know your primary person who you want to serve. And then say, if that person is unable to serve, now the next person, you know, and then you can say, you know, even another person. So that way, you don't necessarily have to change the document because, you know, one, one individual isn't able to do it. But if your document doesn't include, you know, somebody who's able to serve in that role, then you should definitely get your document changed. Okay. Uh, and are you going to cover the, um, oh, Lord, I forgot the word now. Okay. I, I, if I think of it, I'll come, you know, I'm having one of them yeah, brain just falls. Put, put, it, put, it, put it in the chat, Anne, you know, whenever you okay. think of that. Okay. And thank you. Were you, you, think, thank you. Were you thinking of a trust? That's what I, yes. Thank you. Uh-huh. I'm gonna, I'm gonna cover it very briefly. Um, okay. I'll wait till you, till you. Explain. Sure. Okay. Sure. Thank you Absolutely. so much. No problem. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Thank you. Anne. So, um, another you document are. is that we um, help with, and that um, is available in DC. Not it's not available in every state, but it is available in DC. It's a transfer on death deed. Transfer on death deed allows the transfer of title or property without probate at death. Um, so. The way it works is that while somebody is living and they have capacity, they can have created a tr what's called a transfer on death deed, which means that when they, once they are gone, their property would automatically transfer to the beneficiary. Um, during the individual, the grantor's lifetime, they have full control of their property, right? They can sell it. They can do do anything they want to. The beneficiary has no rights to the property until that grantor has died, okay? But the advantage of it is that um, instead of the beneficiaries having to go through a probate process and getting a deed transferred into their name, 
um, the transfer on death deed makes it happen automatically upon the death of the individual. Okay, transfer on death deed is not permanent. So if an individual, you know, forms one, they have a beneficiary and they want to change it, they can revoke it or change it at any time during their lifetime. Okay, um, and again, it's only effective upon death. Um, so, um, the powers of attorney, as I mentioned before, one of the reasons for it is to avoid a guardianships and conservatorships. What, the, what those are, are the processes that where the court appoints someone to manage a person's, um, personal affairs, like their, where they live and their health, or, and that's, that's for guardianship. So a court would appoint a guardianship if there's no uh, power of attorney in place to handle health matters and living situations. A court will appoint a conservator if there's no financial power of attorney in place to handle a person's finances. And so if somebody, you know, doesn't have those documents, they get into a situation where they can't manage their own affairs, then um, that's when a, an adult guardianship conservatorship comes into play. So, um, and as you, you know, as you may have heard, um, it's sort of, it can be a, a long process. Um, it can also be a process where the individual loses their own autonomy, ability to do um, things for themselves. So one difference with a power of attorney is that if you have a financial power of attorney, you can still take care of your own financial situation. You know, you can still write checks, you can still manage your own finances, but your agent can also, if you make it effective immediately, both you and your agent can do those things. Right. But if there's a conservatorship in place, then the individual can no longer do those things. So they lose financial independence. Um, all right. So now I'm going to talk about some other ways to avoid um, probate besides a transfer on death deed. OK, um, so one of the ways to avoid probate is if you have a, a pay on death beneficiary and say if you have a bank account and you decide you, it's if it's a joint account now the, the co-owner will own the you know what's in the account if one person dies okay but if you only you're the only person on the account um then you can have a pay on death beneficiary, that beneficiary will inherit right at the death of the you know, owner of the account without having to go through probate. Life insurance, um, retirement accounts also um, avoid probate. And then another vehicle that, um, that avoids probate is the revocable living trust, okay? And, um, I'll just briefly tell you what the reason for that is. So a trust is a vehicle that is used um, as an alternative to a last will and testament. It allows you to provide for where your property will go, just like a last will and testament does. But the difference is that um, when you have one, you now will put assets. We call we put assets into the trust, and what that means is that you will put, for instance, your bank account. If that's in your trust, you're going to change the name of the account from your individual name to the name of your trust. Okay, and when you do that, when you if you add, put your house or your bank account or other assets into your trust, when you die your trustee, your successor trustees become the technical owners of the assets they're, and they're able to handle the assets 
distribute the assets without needing probate um, because your assets are in this vehicle that we call a trust, okay? Um, when you have a last will and testament, you don't have to change the name of your, the, you don't have to change your bank account to um, the name of your trust. You just keep it, things the way that they are. Um, and, you know, let's just, for some people, if they have um, their main asset, the like primary asset is the house, they can use a last will and testament and a transfer on death deed. Um, and that will sort of take care of, of things because the transfer on death deed handles the, the land or the house. Okay, so that was, that was you know, kind of a lot there with regards to avoiding probate. Um, any questions about that or anything else? Thank you so much for sharing that distinction. Um, We've talked about wills and trusts, you know, quite a uh, bit in our sessions. And uh, it's definitely, um, I think, it, uh, avoiding probate as much as possible is like the, not the best way to go. But uh, what, do you, what do you think of that, Lisa? Because of the, uh, I guess, the time and, you know, that, that it takes and just um, having to do that versus, you know, grieving, you know, the loved one or another person. Uh, what are some advantages of uh, not having to go to probate for some of these different uh, documents? Sure. So probate um, is not only costly because the you know there are fees involved. Not only when it's being opened, but even throughout the process, there are fees involved with it, right? But it's also a a you know time consuming process. It's something that can create, um, you know, a sort of a burden for the person who has to go through it, you know, and, you know, some of you may have already had to go through probate, you know, for somebody else. Um, and if, you know, depending on the size of the estate, it can be a cumbersome process. So if there is a way to avoid it, um, certainly the transfer on death deed is one way to, to avoid it in terms of property. Um, if there's a way to avoid it, that's, that's a good idea. It could save your loved ones um, some, um, you know, time and, um, you know, some frustration. Thank, and thank you so much for uh, answering that. Um, okay, uh, we have... Two more questions. Uh, Ms. Dolores asks, do the legal services, I think legal counsel, help with guardianship paperwork? Yes. So um, legal counsel for the elderly um, does help in a limited way with guardianships. Um, the So one of the requirements is that the individual who the guardianship is being sought for, that the individual um, has to meet our requirements. So be over the age of 60 and fit within the income requirement. And then if that's the case, the person who is trying to become the guardian, um, legal counsel for the elderly can help them through that process. Um, our representation is limited to getting the guardian in place. Um, and that's the biggest part of the process, which is filing the, the paperwork and going through um, the, you know, the legal, the court process of getting the guardian put in place. Thank you so much for uh, answering that. Again, I, I just re-put the uh, legal counsel number for any questions. Um, Louise, uh, you had a question or a comment for, um, Lisa, anything covered so far? I was saying that I changed my, um, I have a trust and I, on, on my bank statement, they always put all the names of the people. And um, my youngest um, child, when my bill, my bank sent me a letter, she said, well, my name is on it so I can open it. I said, you dare not. I said, it, it says P-O-D, so I'm not dead, so you cannot open it. I had to really stand up so I can prevent yeah. her from opening my, my statements. My boys understand, but she didn't. So that was a struggle for a while. And so, But now I got it straight. 
you know, that's one thing you got to be sure because they will open mm. everything. Because their names are there, but it's a POD. Yeah. Yes. So no, they have no ownership. And, right. You know, until have you, <laughs> have you have you heard of that before, Lisa? Um, sure. You know, there are, I mean, um having a beneficiary on your bank accounts that way who will inherit once you're once you're gone is um that's a yeah. really good way of um again of avoiding probate but definitely you know um whenever you have people in certain positions whether they're mm -hmm. your agents or mm -hmm. your beneficiaries you have to be very careful yeah yeah so yes and 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 sometimes um you know, somebody will, well, what you did was have a beneficiary. That's very good. What some people do is they add the person on as a joint owner of the account. Mm. And that means if they're a joint owner in the account, then they can, they do have the right to go into the account, even though the individual may not in, have intended that. They right. may have only intended it so that once they're gone, the person would have the account. But mm -hmm. if they're a joint owner in the account, they're able to access the account even while the person is living. So you yeah. did it the right way. Um, I did POD. Mm -hmm. um, well, I hope that helped out, Louise. Uh, thank you yeah. so much for sharing. Right, because it's just so many. Right now, my main person that I chose to be in charge is trying to back down he didn't want to be because he said he's ra he raised his children already and he's getting older. Don't want to be responsible for nobody else. So I have to go to the second person. And so I have to redo our addendum to that portion, you know, so it's like a pain. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to go over now to say who is going to be the first and who is going to be, and I don't have another third, you know, so, right. oh, it's, uh, it's a mess. Yeah, the, the, third person, the third person is not capable of, Yeah. and the first is backing down. So all I have is one. Maybe you can talk the first one into being in that third position. Yes, yes. Oh, that's wisdom. I like that. <laughs> I get a little less pressure. <laughs> yes, and it will take it off me from worrying about it, you know. Right. Thank you so much. That's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Louise. I'm glad we were able to help out. Yes. Uh huh. Uh, Anne, you had a question or a comment for Lisa? Um, yes. Now, adult guardianship. And conservatorship are two different things. Okay, I got that. If if uh, you wanted somebody to have the adult guardianship, but could you have an another person for a conservator? To okay. Yes. Okay. In DC, in DC, it's two different uh, positions and um, appointments. So you can have the same person, but you also can have two different individuals. Okay. Thank you, Lisa. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, no more questions for now, but uh, thank you so much for sharing this information, uh, Lisa. I know it's really helpful. Oh, you're welcome. Absolutely. Okay. Oh, we have another. Uh, Ms. Doris, you had a question um, or comment for Lisa? I didn't have a question. I just want her to read the chat that I sent to her. Okay. Um, I, I'm sure there was, you know, of course, there was a reason for you to share it through the chat. So, um, Lisa, yeah, because this, this, this is like the, the third time now I haven't heard from nobody yet. Okay. I'll, I will get that information to our um, hotline. Okay. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you, Ms. Doris. Thanks for letting us know. Um, so just to, just to re-ask, uh, Louise, you had another question? A quick question. Um, the adult guardianship, the, the, does the person have to be 65 and over? 60. 60. Mm -hmm. So um, 
I was trying to get guardianship for a person with mental illness, mm -hmm. but they have to be 60. Right, that's that's right. So, but go ahead and call that hotline anyway, because mm -hmm. they can refer you to um, somebody. Yeah. yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Louise. Uh, Lisa, what are the uh, hotlines office, or what is the legal counsel's office hours? I think that's the question. Oh, um, so I think they start at 8.30, um, definitely by 9, but there'll be a recording. When you call, there'll be a recording, and I, and I think it's 8.30. And what I'll say about, about that is you want to call as early as possible um, because... Um, the more the earlier you call, the more likely you'll get a call back um, sometime, you know, sooner um, rather than later. And also, you might actually, instead of having to leave a message, you might be able to speak to um, someone. the The people who answer the um, call generally are are attorneys. And so they can give you legal advice or they'll refer it to another attorney within LCE or they'll refer it to another organization. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's great. I, I love how, you know, you can call, either get help there or you can uh, get referred to someone that can assist you. I really like that. Yeah, and it can be, you know, sometimes you, you might have to call a, a, a few times, especially if you call in the afternoon. But if that happens, um, you know, it's a good idea. If you have contact with you all, contact with Robin, contact with me. If you just like um, Doris did, um, because she, she um, had an issue I'm going to send it to somebody directly. So if you have an issue getting through, um, then you can let me or Robin know. Yes. Do you mind putting your um, email into the chat? I think I have a, I think this is a Robin's right here, but uh, um, yeah, I, please correct that. Is that right, uh, Lisa? That's Robin's email. Let me see. I see that you have the hotline. Um, you have that in there twice, a couple of times. Oh, yeah, that is Robin's, yes. And then mine is, is, is there. Okay, L. M. Brown, is that right? Yes. Okay, uh, let, me, let me let me recheck Robin's real quick. But uh, did you um, you know, since we start a little later today, you know, we can end a little a little bit later. But um, did you have anything else that you wanted to talk about in your uh, um, in your presentation today? No. Um, the the will, um, powers of attorney, transfer on death deeds. And a little bit about guardianship. So that was that was the whole presentation. Okay, um, I really appreciate that. Again, just making sure. Yeah. All right. Uh, I see. Yeah, I see Brenda in the chat. Uh, basically, um, does how, let me ask this? How is the hotline busy? How many is there? A, you know, does there tend to be a lot of calls throughout the week? Is it a um, how how is that like? Because so, Brenda just said she, or one of our uh, yep, seniors said that they try to call, but they haven't received a call back. So I know, um, you know, it, it's a kind of a busy time of year, but uh, what, what is the, um, what, what do you, what do you say to that? Yeah. So, you know, um, things vary. So there may be a time when there's somebody out uh, or a couple people out um, or um, if the calls are, Again, um, I'll, I'll recommend that the calls be real early in the morning. That will be helpful. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of calls. So um, there are a lot of calls. But I, I would say um, that most people who, who do work with legal counsel for the elderly 
you know, find find it worth it. I, it's it's a, I think we're um, you know we're sort of in a fortunate situation to um, be able to get services that you know are generally paid for you know um, um, under this type of you know situation. So I I think you know in in fact right now I would say. Um, especially over this summer, it's been a busy time. Um, but what I would do is call several times, um, especially in the morning. And then if you're not able to get through after a couple times, then um, that, that myself or Robin know. Yes, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, um, becoming fall and, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, changes and things happening and, you know, just the DC area as well. So I can, uh, I can definitely understand that. So again, I just re-put the hotline number again, earlier is better. Um, and I also put Robin's and uh, Lisa's email into the chat. So that way, again, you all can uh, send them an email. So it's great that you all were able to get on today. So you can get that contact information and that way it's a little more set in stone, but, um, are, uh, are folks able to leave voicemails at the hotline number? Is that right as well? Um, you know what? I don't know. I don't know whether they can leave. Um, um, do you know, Doris, when you called before, were you able to leave a voice mes message? Yeah, I left several voice messages. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you. Yes, thank you so much for confirming that, Ms. Doris. I just wanted to know. Yeah, and um, so the you know the best thing I guess is if you call and, and actually speak to somebody, but they but really they should call you back. So if you left a message, you should get a call back. So I I, I will definitely pass your information um, directly to the hotline and to a particular individual to call you back. Thank you all. It's, it's uh, you know, I understand a lot of folks, you know, are just trying to figure out their situations right now. So it's, uh, uh, you just, you just got to be consistent just a little bit. So that way, again, you can find someone to uh, assist you, you know? Uh, so I appreciate that. Um, any other questions for uh, Lisa or any comments about anything that we talked about today? Um, Lisa, what do you, what do you think is the most important thing to leave, you know, your, financial legacy in a good hands in the most seamless way possible. Yeah. So one thing I would say to get the um, get the powers of attorney done. So um, that in, in the event that you're ever incapacitated, you have, you know, the the particular person who you want to make decisions for you. Um, able to do it. I've, I've certainly seen situations where people haven't um, had a power of attorney in place, and then um, there are policies that take over. So, for instance, a ho hospital's policy, hospital's policy might be that they're going to do what your oldest sibling says, right? Um, which may not be what you want. Right, so that might be their policy. Their policy might be that they are going to um, do what your spouse says. I mean, you know, so I would just say um, get get those two um, powers of attorney done, so you can select who can make decisions for you if you can't. Um, and then the other thing is that you know sometimes people think in terms of getting a will or whatever, you know that they have to have a certain, um, you know, they have to, they may have some number in their head. They may have some, this, my state must be at this point, but that's not true because as we all know, people um, have disagreements, you know, after, you know, our family members pass away, there are disagreements about who can have what. Um, and so you can think about that ahead of time and make, um, plans for that so that there, you know, hopefully is um, less confusion. Um, and that's that's a way of, you know, doing something nice um, for your for your 
you know, loved ones. Thank you so much for those pieces of advice. Yes, uh, powers of attorney and wills, just to make the process easier for, I guess, all, you know? <laughs> so that way, you know, again, we can focus on the person, you know, that just had passed away. So you could celebrate their life and not, you know, have those legal troubles and all those things happen. So it's a, it's a, it's a good, it's, it's a great thing to take care of. So um, thank you. Uh, Ms. Doris, you had a question for uh, Lisa? Uh, Alan, for for the, uh, have the will done, is there a fee for that? No, not, not um, from legal counsel for the elder fee. There's no fee. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ms. Doris. And then last but sorry, not least, Lisa, um, I know with your other uh, slideshow you had, just generally what the legal counsel can do, you know, again, we can say, you know, if you have any legal issues or concerns, you can call the leadership or the legal counsel for the elderly, but I know you had like housing, um, I think it was yeah. economic security. So just really briefly, can you just mention like those five different pillars that you assist with? Sure. sure. So there's a tenants advocacy um, division for, of legal counsel for the elderly and they help people who are facing eviction or other types of um, issues relating to renting um, property. There's a consumer group and that helps people who are maybe facing issues with their home evictions or also fraud um, and that, that type of thing. There, there's, they are the consumer advocacy group. Um, uh, economic and healthcare security is the division that Robin and I are in, um, and we do uh, life planning, probate, guardianships, public benefits, and veterans benefits, okay? And those public benefits include um, Social Security retirement, Social Security disability, um, um, EPD waivers, um, uh, private duty nursing um, care, and then um, the uh, legal counsel for the elderly also um, had, sorry, also has um, social workers um, that work so uh, with our teams. So, um, you know, if you do have some legal issue um, and you're and you call and you you get through um, to somebody um, on the legal hotline, then um, you know they can direct you to see if somebody in house can help you or not. I will say that the issues are all civil matters, right? So um, they're civil matters, but um, the hotline attorneys are familiar with other groups in DC. Um, you know, what they do if, if it's not something that we can do. And that an example of that is if like a guardianship for somebody who's under our age group, that's a good example. Wow, again, thank you so much. That's a lot of issues or challenges that you all help out with. So, you know, I think it's just really important to take advantage of the different resources, you know, um, and share it with your friends and family. We, you know, unfortunately may know someone that's dealing with some eviction issues right now or housing issues, you know, with the, uh, with the end of a lot of like COVID funded projects and things of that nature. So I think that's really great scams and fraud, you know, that's just, you know, gonna go up, you know, bit by bit each and every year. So it's important to learn and get help and not feel ashamed for that help, you know, cause it can happen to anybody, uh, social workers, of course, and just any issue, it's great that you all can either direct someone in or out of house for someone to get the best help that they uh, can get, you know? <laughs> and, and let me just mention that I specifically work um, on the EHS team, the Economic Health Care and Security Act um, division um, with homebound um, individuals. So there are other attorneys. So for instance, if you wanted a will, and you're able to come to the office, then um, there are attorneys here who work with you. Um, but I specifically work with individuals who are either in a hospital or 
um, in a nursing home or you know some some type of rehabilitation center or you know or they're unable to leave their homes. So just in case you know some people, somebody who has issues and they're not able to come over to um, where we are, they're homebound. We do assist those individuals as well. Oh wow! Thank thank you so much. I know the work that you do is so so important. So we really appreciate that. Uh, well, because you mentioned the office, uh, Brenda said, uh, where are you located and are you, uh, um, is it like drop in or do you have to make an appointment? Yeah, you do have to um, get in touch with the, um, the hotline and they'll set a, you up with an appointment. Um, I'm putting the address in the chat. Um, let me just mention too that, um, let me make sure I have the right zip code mentioned that there's also um, what we call self-help centers in, in different communities. So we have um, a, uh, under EHS, under Economic Health Care and Security, there is a group called the Self-Help Office. Um, and so there's five different locations um, around DC. Where you can just walk in. Well, no, I'm sorry. You need to make an appointment for some of that, and for some you can walk in. Okay, so um, you can become aware of when there's an attorney there, um, and those different look and where those locations are. But for the most part, people who are able to come to the office will come to our 601 E Street office. Um, so that's that's the majority of people who um, of, of our clients come here. Then there's the ones who are homebound, and then there are individuals who come to one of our show sites. But those show sites are only there's only somebody there on particular days. You know, this is the same person she goes from one location to another. So you'll really need to find out if you wanted to do that instead of coming here. Um, you know, when she's in a particular place. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much for the information. Again, uh, just looking on, you know, the website, um, again, different services like public benefits, social services, legal forms, any, um, again, financial issues, uh, um, records information, uh, you all help out with a lot. So um, I, I really appreciate that. Okay, our, our last question, and I think it's very important before we end for today, but make sure you just stay on for the poll. So you can let us know how you felt about today's session. But Yvonne asked, can the legal counsel help with housing? And, okay. and how do they do that? Okay. Um, so legal counsel um, generally helps with legal issues, right? So um, not, so not um, helping find um, housing. But again, um, our hotline does have resources, can direct you to different resources. Um, one of the things that legal counsel does do, though, is you, you may have heard of ERAP program, so people who um, need rental assistance, um, so they're, they're already in a um, rental situation, or even homeowners um, who need assistance, financial assistance with um, um, paying their rent or paying their mortgage. ERAP is a program that mm -hmm. the for the elderly does assist people with because there's an application process there. And um, and so our tenants group does help people with that program. Thank you. Wow. I, that, and, you know, a lot of people, folks have heard of ERAP, but that's really great that you all help out with that. Specifically, I think the application opens October 1st of this year. Um, so it's better to do that sooner rather than later because those funds, you know, they get uh, used up quite fast. <laughs> so, uh, but yes. Wow. Well, again, thank you so much for coming on to our uh, session, Lisa. Um, I'm glad we were able to get through everything. And uh, I know we helped out a couple of folks just with our questions and I hope you all enjoyed other folks' questions and it helped you out. And please share this information um, with your friends uh, and family so they can uh, also get help from the uh, legal counsel. Um, any last words for today, Lisa? 
No, I just want to thank um, all of you for your patience there um, in the beginning and for being so attentive and asking um, great questions. Um, again, um, I know you have uh, both the hotline number and also um, my email um, address. And so um, I'm not going to forget you, Doris. I'm going to take care of that as soon as we get off. Um, and I appreciate all of you. Yeah, thank you so much. Again, make sure you stay on to complete the poll, everyone. But let's thank Lisa so much for her wonderful job and for her persistence in showcasing what the leader or the legal counsel can do for you. Thank you so much, Lisa, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was thank very you so good. Much. Very helpful. Thank you. Very thank good. You, Lisa. Good. Thank you so much. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you so much. Oh, we have to.